Right, welcome to week four. This is an overview of the physical sciences strand as, as embedded in the ACS. A couple of things to look at this week. Um, obviously we're moving along with our assessment and by the end of week six we will have uh, submitted our assessment task number one. Um, again, it contains two parts. One is the case study component with your learners and featuring the learners' misconceptions and your identification of that. And part B is your response to that as a teacher, your learning sequence. Now, last week we looked at the chemical sciences strand, and so you have a fairly good understanding of how this document works, how it's layered and how it's constructed. You will understand that it moves from the foundation year through to the year 10 level, and that it's a continuum. Embedded in that document are a series of scientific themes known as strands. Those strands are broken down into understandings, or conceptual uh, uh, models, and those conceptual models are scaffolded over different year levels. Your assessment task actually tests how well you've understood that scaffolding. For instance, I have had emails from students talking about using exercises involving gravity at year two and three of the curriculum. Now, if you look at the ACS, gravity does not appear until level seven, year seven. So we've got a couple of issues here. If you are going to use a science misconception that is not in your current year, year level that you're targeting, then you need to break that conception down to meet the inquiry skills and the understandings and the endeavors associated with your year. If you do that, then you're successfully meeting the learning sequence requirement. So let's have a look at what we're going to talk about this week. I'll introduce you to someone called Professor Mark Weatherall from South Australia in a short video and he talks about the notion of the ACS being a continuum. And the notion of a, a continuum is that it's not just a series of um, block science facts or, or, or you know, a gathering of uh, scientific evidence and you know, lumped together as a teachable block. It actually is a continuum and, and it begins you know, as he'll explain better than I will, it begins from a very early stage of saying, you know, here is your very, in a bloom sense, you know, here is the concept, here is the knowing, and what would happen to that knowing if, and, and from that question of if, we move right through the curriculum, adding further questions. So the physical sub uh, science of substrand, let's, let's establish some common ground. It's concerned with understanding the nature of forces and motion, matter and energy. So there's four parts to it, forces, motion, matter, energy. The two concepts developed within the substrand of the physical sciences, forces affect the behaviour of objects and energy can be transferred and transformed from one form to another. They're really simply put, but they're very broad scientific principles. Forces can affect behaviour, energy can be transferred and transformed. Let's have a look at how that can be done. So through the substrand, students are required to gain an understanding of how an object's motion, the direction, speed, acceleration, for instance, maybe as it's dropping, is influenced by a range of contact and non-contact forces such as friction, magnetism, gravity and electrostatic forces. So you can see they range in complexity and we're going to look at a couple of examples throughout today's session um, to, sh to show you how you can scaffold that from the very simple, um, you can model it using some digital resources and you can you know, extrapolate it into the, you know, in, into the the final E, the evaluation and exploration stages of the 5E's model. Secondly, students can develop an understanding of the concept of energy. Okay, and this is the second theme to come through, and how energy transfer is associated with phenomena involving motion, heat, sound, light, and electricity. And finally, learners appreciate that concepts of force, motion, matter and energy apply to systems ranging in scale from atoms to the universe itself. So notice the key word here, scale. So let's have a close look at some of the key principles here. Um, scale, we're not unified to one level of exploration. The understanding of concept and energy, energy transfer, and in motion, heat, sound, light and electricity. So music fits in here. We can talk here about the substrand of how an object's motion and we've got things like direction, speed, acceleration. And we can look at some of the forces that impact on that. Friction, magnetism, gravity and electrostatic forces. We have here quite a broad ranging uh, 
quite a deep and rich heuristic here for exploring physical sciences. Professor Mark Weatherall talks about this being a continuum. Let's listen to what he's got to say. Let's listen to what Professor Mark Weatherall's got to say about the notion of a continuum. And again, he's talking here about the ACS, about um, a composite class, about multi-age learning, but also breaks it down to look at how the ACS can help differentiate between learner abilities and learner needs. And if we stick with reception one and two, in that description that can be revealed, there's a, a, a statement about what reception one and two is about, what the flow is through reception one and two. And it really talks about it being about observations, patterns, and then predictions. That's that flow that runs through it. And then in each of the year level descriptions, it unpacks that for particular years. So in the foundation years, it unpacks it. And in the foundation years, what it's really saying is, um, what, what, what have you noticed? What have you seen? What have you heard? What have you, what have you felt? What did you, what did you observe? What did you notice in that process? As we go through and go through into year one, we're still talking about that overarching observations, patterns, and predictions. And so the focus in year one is about the patterns. And really what that's saying is, what do you think? What do you think about that? What does that make you think? You know, what, what, what's, the, what's going on there? What's really going on there? Um, a, a little bit of why do you think that's happening? What are you wondering? And then as we go through into year two, we've got that same statement about observations, patterns, and predictions. And now where we're going with the year uh, twos is to ask some questions about, well, what do you think if? What do you think would happen if? What do you think would happen if we change things? What do you think would happen if, things were, if something was different, if you did it in a different way? Um, we're starting to ask some questions about predictions. You know, how could we transfer this thing that we've been thinking to something else? And so what we're seeing is that you don't have to compartmentalise it into reception one and two. You can actually take that theme that the Australian curriculum has given us right across reception one and two and do it with our composite class. And so we might be focusing with the receptions on what did you notice? We might be focusing with the year ones on what did you think? And we might be focusing with the year twos on what do you think if, what do you think if things were different to make some predictions and to think about the future, to anticipate changes and, and other applications. But they're all having a shared experience, but learning, the learning intent for each of them is slightly different. And so those themes through the Australian curriculum really allow us to see where the curriculum is going, where the intent of the curriculum is going, and to make that work for our composite classes. If we haven't got composite classes, and we've just got that year one class, it also gives us a, a view of where we're coming from and where we're going to. And so rather than this learning being that fragmented, standalone learning, it's much more part of a, of a learning narrative, much more part of a learning journey. And, w and that might help us to see where different students are on that journey, and so to d differentiate the curriculum appropriately for those students, and differentiate differentiate our support differently for those students in terms of the, the distance that they're travelling down that pathway. That's a really, really useful insight, isn't it? That the Australian curriculum is in fact a continuum, that it's about teaching from a particular place, teaching to a particular place. Along that we are going to find content and stage appropriate materials and resources, and we're also going to find how we as teachers need to target multi-age and multi-abilities within that framework. It could be within the one year, it could be across year levels, but the reality is this is not a block model, the Australian curriculum. It is a continuum. It's a sequence. And in your learning sequence for assessment task number one, you are going to need to demonstrate also, through questioning and through the structure of your learning sequence, how your misconception, how your teaching of a misconception um, has been correctly located within the ACS and also how you're actually targeting things like uh, multi-ability groups and differentiation of learning within that.
So, you know, you are going to reveal to yourself, for instance, that there will be groups within your class group that this resource really needs to target and, and target explicitly and well. So the learning outcomes from the week four um, is basically to locate the physical science understandings in the Australian curriculum and know where they are. Describe some creative ways that physical scientists can be explored in the classroom. And identify some common misconceptions from the chemical and physical sciences, which basically make up um, the physical sciences framework. The key terms, physical science is the study of the nature and properties of energy and non-living matter. Misconceptions, where, where something's been partially understood or has been completely misunderstood. Again, it's another continuum and we work within continuums. As Vygotsky said, we work within zones. And a misconception of a misconception, this is one I've added in hindsight, because I'm, you know, I'm really just alerting you here to the fact that you can misconceive where your misconception is located. So make sure you're checking that you're dealing at the right stage of the ACS with your approach and that you're dealing in the right science understanding. Um, and this really is your responsibility to locate and determine. So, you know, again, we don't really want to see people exploring gravity at year three when it appears at year seven, unless, of course, you can link that to one of the key understandings that you need to develop at the year three level, one of the elaborations embedded there. So if you're going to use gravity at year three, make sure you explicitly link it to an elaboration and that your learning sequence explores that elaboration in considerable depth and detail. Now, there's a range of ways to target um, the ACS and you develop in, in, in assessment task one, part B, um, the physical sciences is huge. And some of us have a real block, for instance, to chemical sciences. Um, some of us have real block to, you know, exploring circuit boards. Um, all of these, let's break them down to really quite simple sciences if we can. Scoodle does this well. Another reminder of just how useful Scoodle is. Now, Scoodle is a fabulous resource. Um, it's easy to point you towards a car and say, here is the, uh, the F to 10 um, curriculum outline. Um, here is the substrand physical sciences, have a look at what you've got to do. But often many of us are actually visual. Um, and when we go into a new field, it's best to visualise that field by looking at, at what other teachers are doing. I mean, this is really good social learning um, from Albert Bandura's school. It's, it's also very good modelling. Um, if we look at the, the apprentice, uh, the cognitive apprenticeship model um, from Professor John Bain, um, there's a lot of good reasons why we would look at existing resources and, you know, if we're going to replicate them and pick out the best of these. Now, later on, I'm going to show you a, a great little resource from the PHET site, the FET site, coming out of the University of Boulder in Colorado, which actually looks at circuits. And if we go down to Year 8, for instance, in Scoodle, um, we can see what resources are actually available here. Um, and we can see under the physical sciences, energy appears in different forms, including movement, kinetic energy, heat and potential energy, and energy transformations and transfers cause changes within systems. So we can actually view the matching resources there inside Scoodle, and it takes us to energy chains about how to make electricity, um, energy chain uses, and it takes us building, you know, through energy chains to build an actual energy change. Now, of course, they've got a great link here uh, to an interactive. Um, but FET also has a fabulous interactive, which I'll show you later. So when we go to look at this interaction here, and you can see the nice thing is that it, it, it talks about the standard to which you're actually working, um, and it gives you a really good chance to view the resource, and it also gives you additional teacher information um, on the resource. And um, as you can see there, it gives you the educational details, the strands in which it sits, and all of the topics which it actually deals with, electricity, energy conversion, natural resources, and renewable energy. So you can see it's quite a rich resource. Um, now I haven't actually played with this one, but we can view the, view the resource. Um, and oh, allow and remember. And we can see down comes our resource. Welcome to energy chains, build an energy chain. And as you can see here, for instance, we've got, uh, before you start, see if you can put the picture of the ship. Um, and again, obviously it's skilling up um, and getting people ready to start. So you begin to explore the energy chain from this particular point. So you get the introduction to the activity, get some background information. Um, and again, it's a very, very good uh, example of how to go about um, exploring and building this particular unit. <laughs> And 
once you've got this power station up and running, of course you're then able to start the activity. And again, get your navigation strategies right. Please have a really good look at these. Um, they're fabulous resources. And again, I'll put up a little short video later of the uh, similar resource, um, which has got to do with electricity and electric circuits in the um, uh, uh, FET um, side, which of course is a more traditional form of science. Now the reason why I put uh, this little example in um, is obviously it's up here. It's linked to the primary connections learning sequences. So you know you have here a link from the primary connections. You have a full unit of teaching. It elaborates where the you know primary connections team would locate this particular resource and also this particular ACS uh, science understanding. Um, and of course you can see it's up at year seven and eight. So um, some of the understandings, as you well know, you may be starting to differentiate. Some are suitable for lower primary levels. Some obviously explicitly connect to upper primary levels. If you are going to use resources at a different primary level, please make sure you build a scaffold to those resources for your learner. Okay, video inspirations. This week in, the, uh, in, in week four, in the um, uh, activity section, we, um, we list a couple of activities for you, and again, trying to keep them to a minimum, but trying to also keep them focused and leaning towards developing your understandings of the first assessment task. So as you can see, Dennis Goodrum pops his head up again. He, you know, as obviously you can see, he's, he's, he's founded the ACS. Um, he, he is also uh, responsible for the direction ACARA has taken. So he really is a person we should be quoting and, and, and exploring. Um, but he, he comes up with some really good understandings here of what science does in our lives. Um, and it talks about health, food, the environment, the things we eat. Um, it, you know, there's legislation governing, you know, food and petrol emissions and motor. It, there's a whole range of different things which science um, you know, informs our decisions. So it takes interesting questions according to Dennis. Um, and it gives us, you know, the fields of endeavour, it gives us the science skills and understandings in which we are required to break these interesting questions down, develop a scientific model or a, a scientific approach, inquiry model, which to pursue and understand these. Now, here's a little example, for instance, from TED-Ed. Now, I will keep directing you to resources. Um, it's part of the responsibility here to show you ways of teaching these concepts that are going to save you time and also help you build your own competencies. Now this is a little example from a, um, a chemistry lesson. Um, bearing in mind that the physical sciences are all about energy and matter. Essentially that's what the definition of the physical sciences are. The sciences related to energy and the science related to matter. Now this is one related to energy and matter conversion. Um, and the question to ask yourself here is what, what does the process of emulsion have to do with baking cookies. Now this is from TED-Ed, uh, a unit by Stephanie Warren, and the nice thing about TED-Ed is it's sessions done by teachers for teachers. Have a look at this one and see what you think of this actual little video, and the science involved in something as simple as baking cookies. In a time-lapse video, it looks like a monster coming alive. For a moment, it sits there innocuously. Then, ripples move across its surface. It bulges outwards, bursting with weird boils. It triples in volume, its color darkens ominously, and its surface hardens into an alien topography of peaks and craters. Then the kitchen timer dings. Your cookie is ready. What happened inside that oven? Don't let the apron deceive you. Bakers are mad scientists. When you slide the pan into the oven, you're setting off a series of chemical reactions that transform one substance, dough, into another, cookies. When the dough reaches 92 degrees Fahrenheit, the butter inside melts, causing the dough to start spreading out. Butter is an emulsion, or mixture of two substances that don't want to stay together, in this case, water and fat, along with some dairy solids that help hold them together. As the butter melts, its trapped water is released, and as the cookie gets hotter, the water expands into steam. It pushes against the dough from the inside, trying to escape through the cookie walls, like Ridley Scott's chest-bursting alien. Your eggs may have been home to squirming salmonella bacteria. An estimated 142,000 Americans are infected this way each year. Though salmonella can live for weeks outside a living body, and even survive freezing, 136 degrees is too hot for them. When your dough reaches that temperature, they die off. You'll live to test your fate with the bite of raw dough you sneak from your next batch. At 144 degrees, changes begin in the proteins, which come mostly from the eggs in your dough. 
Eggs are composed of dozens of different kinds of proteins, each sensitive to a different temperature. In an egg fresh from the hen, these proteins look like coiled up balls of string. When they're exposed to heat energy, the protein strings unfold and get tangled up with their neighbors. This linked structure makes the runny egg nearly solid, giving substance to squishy dough. Water boils away at 212 degrees, so like mud baking in the sun, your cookie gets dried out and it stiffens. Cracks spread across its surface. The steam that was bubbling inside evaporates, leaving behind airy pockets that make the cookie light and flaky. Helping this along is your leavening agent, sodium bicarbonate, or baking soda. The sodium bicarbonate reacts with acids in the dough to create carbon dioxide gas, which makes airy pockets in your cookie. Now it's nearly ready for a refreshing dunk in a cool glass of milk. One of science's tastiest reactions occurs at 310 degrees. This is the temperature for Maillard reactions. Maillard reactions result when proteins and sugars break down and rearrange themselves, forming ring-like structures, which reflect light in a way that gives foods like Thanksgiving turkey and hamburgers their distinctive rich brown color. As this reaction occurs, it produces a range of flavor and aroma compounds, which also react with each other, forming even more complex tastes and smells. Caramelization is the last reaction to take place inside your cookie. Caramelization is what happens when sugar molecules break down under high heat, forming the sweet, nutty, and slightly bitter flavor compounds that define, well, caramel. And in fact, if your recipe calls for a 350 degree oven, it'll never happen, since caramelization starts at 356 degrees. If your ideal cookie is barely browned, like a Northeasterner on a beach vacation, you could have set your oven to 310 degrees. If you like your cookies to have a nice tan, crank up the heat. Caramelization continues up to 390 degrees. And here's another trick. You don't need that kitchen timer. Your nose is a sensitive scientific instrument. When you smell the nutty, toasty aromas of the Maillard reaction and caramelization, your cookies are ready. Grab your glass of milk, put your feet up, and reflect that science can be pretty sweet. Now you can see they're quite really uh, useful um, lessons there. And the, the Maillard reaction, of course, has its principles in science, obviously in food technology as well. Um, and you could look at you know, quite a few range of extension activities there, an investigation about actually baking some cookies and setting different temperatures and setting the inquiry task. And you can mix the ingredients and, again, ultimately, then get the students to work backwards from the ultimate cookie through to the science um, of the ultimate cookie. So you can have a lot of fun with this particular task and you don't need to be an expert in science. So moving on, we'll keep looking at some additional resources. Um, activity two for the week um, looks at everyday physics and you know we can look at a whole range of different um, aspects for instance you know often one of the connections with physics is the engagement stage kids switch off however if you don't tell them it's physics they you know they then start to engage in smaller um, little examples here's one uh, John Travoltage which actually looks at the whole notion of static electricity now when we thought about some everyday um, physics exp experiments or everyday physics phenomenon um, some of these that came up um, shocks from the car door curving a football kick now there's a brilliant video in in, in, uh, in this week's resources um, there's, I give you a hundred free uh, uh, science lessons in there you'll find a brilliant one on just how to curve a football the science and physics of curving a football the poles of a magnet outboard motors mobile phones microwave oven and of course some great resources on music for kids if you're working across a, a talented uh, arts group but John Travoltage let's have a look now this little example here is uh, one by the name of John Travoltage. In John Travoltage students can explore ideas about static electricity in particular what happens when you touch a doorknob and feel or even see a spark we can rub John Travoltage's foot against the rug resulting in excess electrons on his body he can then get a spark by bringing his hand close to the doorknob. Yeah. You can use our other sim, Balloons and Static Electricity, to compare this behavior to that of a charged insulator. When John Travoltage rubs his foot against the rug, electrons are transferred from the rug to his foot. This leaves behind excess positive charges on the rug, which aren't shown in this sim. You might ask students to predict what will happen when only a few electrons are on his body. In this case, there is not a large enough electric field to ionize the air between the doorknob and his hand. So let's rub his foot some more. 
Electrons repel each other, so they spread out rather evenly on his body. In reality, they would not be quite so clustered on his leg. As electrons accumulate, an electric field is developed between his finger and the doorknob. This electric field strength increases as we bring his finger closer to the doorknob, until the point where it's strong enough to ionize the air. The lightning bolt shows where electrons flow from his finger to the doorknob. You can ask students to explain how the spark is affected by the amount of charge accumulated and the distance between his finger and the doorknob. If we accumulate a lot of charge, the electric field is quite large, and we can get a spark even when his finger is quite far from the doorknob. But with a small amount of charge, we need to bring his finger quite close to the doorknob to get a spark. You might also challenge your students to explain why John only says, ouch, sometimes. What the body feels is the current, or the rate of flow of electrons from the finger. With just a little current, John doesn't mind so much. For a large current, we need a large number of electrons and a large electric field to make those electrons flow quickly. John feels that one. If you don't have enough electrons and they're not flowing quickly enough, you don't get that satisfying ouch. Yeah. Have fun shocking John Travoltage. Now you can see those resources come from FET, um, which is a free um, resource uh, available to teachers from the University of Bolo Boulder, Colorado in the States. Now I do like the FET resources, and I do encourage you to think about using them as much as you possibly can. Obviously you'd look at the SIM page and you'd look at the extensions between John Travoltage and how that may connect, for instance, to things like clouds and thunder and lightning and raising the question, can lightning actually strike twice in the same place? All of these are really, really good science investigations for you to consider. And just to remind you, FET is free. Um, so if you just Google FET, um, you will need to register, but um, it does give you access to some tremendous resources, and they all come with an embed code. So if you're using a blog or a wiki, you can actually just embed that particular resource into your wiki, and your students have access to it all the time. And you can see it, it gives them some extension, you know, some real extension opportunities without them leaving the room. A, l a couple of emails from students have really concerned me. So this, this assessment task, this activity comes in really, really well at this point in time. Um, it's about mapping the ACS and some of the common misconceptions that we're, we're getting uh, exposed to here. Um, and for instance, you know, the moon only appears at night. We, here we've tried to come up with the, the, uh, um, the science understanding uh, or the substrand, and you see Earth and space, and it's across the multiple levels. So again, that's quite a generic one to do. Diamonds are indestructible, again, comes up in the chemical um, uh, si understandings, um, or strand, substrand. Boats are made of materials that float, again, comes in the physical. Uh, no mammals lay eggs, again, biological. Um, and we can see that, you know, the year levels to which these pertain. Um, it's really important to get your misconceptions right. So please have a close look at these. Um, you know, year levels one and four. Um, there's some great resources also in TED Ed on, on sharks, um, you know, really brilliant stuff on, on the fact that sharks eat people, you know, it's a misconception. Um, please have a, have a you know, really good look at these tables because it gives you some breakdown um, as to you know, where your ACS should be focusing. And again, to, to, to be successful in part B of this assignment, your learning sequence is going to have to be, you know, correctly age and ability pitched. So it's going to actually have to address the misconception that's relevant to a curriculum level to justify your warrant of teaching it. Because if you're teaching something outside a curriculum level, then clearly you've got no warrant to do that. You know, so it does challenge what you're doing, and you need to make sure that at the moment, if your misconception is not entirely lined up to the, your level, make sure you go to the elaborations in your particular substrand and look at what those elaborations are and line them up. Okay, it's up to you to do that. Um, activity four in this week's material would get you to, to share your investigations. And again, there's a link there to a hundred science investigations, and you know they're just brilliant. They're often quite simple. Some of my favourites are the colour, the wavelengths of light. All you need is a torch and some cellophane paper and three elastic bands. It's a beauty, and you shine it on a wall, and you know, ironically, at, at, at the very cortex of those three lights. You, you actually come up with a white spot. So, you know, really getting students to explore and understand that is really important. The colours of shadows, too. When you look at when you shine a light, that the light's beyond the board, 
um, and see what colour the shadows are, you, you'll get some, some really interesting results there too in discussions. Cartesian divers, always a lot of fun, particularly because of the extension um, possibilities there. Slayers and Forces. Now this is a really um, nice little resource here from uh, STEM Education in the UK. Again, STEM Education, if you Google it, um, you will come up with a member and registration page. It is a free resource. I encourage you to jump on there because once again, it also comes with its embed codes. And have a little look at this one. It's a fun little activity on Slayers and Forces. And as you can see, it's quite suitable for quite young age groups. Now this little activity is from the BBC and it's really really good in case you, um, you know, you're short on resources and you're short on class time. The students can also do this as an extension activity um, and it can be used to flip the classroom in a range of ways. But it's an interactivity and an interactive activity and you can use it as an introduction to an investigation that looks at how a toy vehicle moves on different surfaces. We can ask the children for instance to incorporate some prediction to predict how far the sleigh will move on each surface and then we can order the services from shortest distance um, to longest distance um, to actually do some data logging. Um, children can then carry out their own investigation using ramps and covered materials, predicting which would allow the car to travel the greatest distance. And it's, you know, it's a really, really good extension for getting students um, to look at how car moves as friction um, is part of the, the curriculum, the ACS curriculum. <coughs> and um, it also will allow you to do some extension activities and build a learning unit. So we follow the instructions here. So at the moment we've set the site on carpet. We simply pull the handle back to the yellow light and we give the sleigh a little push and off it goes. So we'll do the reset. We'll follow through the activity. And we can see there something happens. We do a reset this time. Pull the red handle back to the yellow light. We flick on pull the round handle back to the red light to give the sleigh a bigger push. Then we'll see how it goes. Alright, how far does it travel now? We can put wood on the screen as a track surface, follow the instructions so it's common to each student. We give it a little push. And first of all we have to do a reset. Okay, and I think you get the idea, don't you? It's pretty, pretty simple. Um, and a stronger push, we get a stronger distance. And again, so on. It takes you through carpet, um, and then go back to ice, and obviously we can look. What do you think? With the same push, the sleigh travels different distances on different surfaces. What surface and what push must you use to get the sleigh to travel past the last flag and off the screen? So a little bit of predicting there as you can see and then it's largely observation and from there we move into closing up that particular activity. This is on the BBC for those of you with really good glasses. It's school science clips and it's usually age 8 to 9 which translates roughly um, and nicely into our own curriculum levels. So that's a BBC resource and again if you Google STEM teaching UK you'll come up with uh, a membership requirement which will give you access to all of these resources so there's you know the UK have many many online resources um, for use by teachers so it's, it's free um, commons use. Another little one that um, uh, I've actually taken from FET is um, on circuits. Now the reason why I put this one up here is um, I had a, f a conversation with a few students via email and, and um, in, in the uh, Zoom collaborative um, that a couple of people are actually a, a little bit anxious about dealing with um, circuits and circuitry. Um, and of course, you know, how, how to actually do it, um, what happens when things break down. Now, um, and you'll also go into a lot of schools where they don't actually have these resources on tap. So this is a nice little one. Um, it's, it's, again, if you go, go in Google FET, it's a free registration site. And um, I'll take you through the video. I've actually pre-recorded this. Um, to set this one up, I actually set up quite a simple circuit for illustrative purposes. Um, it, you can do much, much more with this than I've done. It's just, to, again, to show you the capacity of it and the sorts of things you can do. So let's have a look at the video. And you know, it may be something that you wish to use or that you could use in your teaching. Um, or if you are teaching another unit on electricity, it may be something you do as an extension student, uh, extension resource for some of your um, uh, fast or, or elaborate learning students. As you can see, what I've done here in this little site, this comes from FET, P-H-E-T, which is a, a website coming out of the University of Boulder, Colorado. 
Now, the reason why I'm promoting this one is A, it's, it's free, and it's available to all of you, and B, FET has hundreds, literally hundreds, a thousand, three thousand, I think they have, um, of these kinds of resources. And they're really, really good. I mean, you can see that this one here actually is all about circuit building. Um, and what I've managed to do is build a really simple circuit. Sorry for the ugly shape. I've just done this quickly in a hurry. And it, it's a very simple process. You can just jump into the grad bag, and here's your investigation. You can see that you can put a, a dollar bill in there. You can put a paper clip, a penny, an eraser, uh, a lead pencil, a hand, or a dog. Any of those things can go in there to make your actual circuit, and you can test them as circuit breakers or circuit supporters. Here we've got a resistor. It's really important, again, when you build a circuit, you don't put your resistors in, depending on the energy you've got going through here, the voltage and the ohms. Um, you'll actually be creating fire. So it's really important to you know think about how your system's going to work, your battery, and when we look at all of these different things, you can put your battery, for instance, you can take a battery and put it in place. Right mouse click, you can change the voltage, you can change the resistance, you can reverse the polarities, um, or you can show the value of that particular battery. So it's a 9 volt battery at this particular point in time. We can then also delete it if we no longer wish to move it. Now you can see simply by manipulating these variables and building your own circuits that you can actually test students' understandings of circuitry even though you don't have the equipment there on board to do it at that particular time. So if you've done an in-class investigation or you're building up to one, this is a wonderful simulation to enable your learners to learn a little bit about basic circuitry and energy flows. And you can see it's all free. You can get on there and once you've played with it for five minutes yourself, it becomes really quite simple. And you can then start to use it to set up some pretty basic science investigations. Now this is a really good one because, um, again, talking about misconceptions, we're talking here about um, you know representations. What 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 does electricity look like? Now in the week three online lecture, um, we had a few representations of electricity, um, and some people draw it as balls, some people draw it as lines, some people draw it as jagged lines like lightning. Um, there's a whole range of ways of visualising electricity. But the nice thing about some of these FET resources is they actually allow you um, to visualise and they allow the learner to visualise, and they support or they challenge um, learner representations. So if the learner is right off with their concept of what electricity may look like as it flows, then these kinds of activities actually help correct, help, re ap you know, help realign that misconception that the learner has. And then they can get in there and actually play with some of these tasks um, and, and you know work out how these systems work together. So this is one resource that could go up and down the age level in the curriculum. So even though electricity doesn't really occur till in the, the upper primary and, and early high school years, um, you can actually use this resource to explore energy flows and, and models of energy. So um, it, you know, it, it's one of those ones that can help you um, address misconceptions, even though you know electricity is not really a, um, a, a concept that you would explore in, in you know mandatorily in the early stages of the ACS. So some resources will enable you to um, build in some scaffolding as you go through. So this week was largely about the uh, physical um, sciences. Um, it was an overview of um, the uh, um, framework, the ACARA framework. Um, and along with that overview, um, we've tried to tie it pretty much into assessment task number one, part B, where you're um, designing a learning sequence which is meant to be, and hopefully destined to be, um, you know, accurate, um, accurate to age, suitable for different abilities, and able to differentiate, able to allow you as a teacher to, to develop differentiation strategies in your teaching of that misconception. and there is no need to overreact. <laughs>